I, I think I might get going because it's, uh, it's getting on for five past. Um, there's a few people joining now, so that's okay. Um, well, look, thanks, thanks for coming. I think this is our fifth um, fifth session. Um, I'm sure you're aware we're recording this, um, and the recordings of all the previous ones are available. Uh, should you be interested? And if you get if you're having trouble accessing them, just um, let Tara know. I'm sure she can uh, facilitate that. So today it's uh, it's very much um, talking about Alert Safe, but I'm also going to talk about some of the projects that uh, that we're doing um, and some of the things that hopefully we'll be looking for in the future. So is that you, Scott from Hills Tankers? Morning. How are we? Yeah, very good. Thanks. That's good. So. Um, I'll just share the screen now. Um, at, well, just going through the agenda, I'm going to say a few things about what we've been doing. And then um, Mark's going to talk about the new Monash model that we've uh, put into the Alert Safe Suite, which is a, a slightly different sort of model. And um, David's going to talk about how he's been using uh, our technology to deal with some problems around on call, where we've had a few, a few customers are saying, OK, well, we're not working sort of a standard shift pattern. How can we figure out what the fatigue uh, impacts of that might be? So without further ado, I'll share my screen. OK, so going back to this uh, this uh, urine review, um, I think um, the transport sector has been quite interesting because, um, you know, there's been COVID and uh, staff shortages and fuel price increases and, and a lot of pressure on that, that sector. But um, we're still getting projects and uh, we just um, halfway through a project in the fuel sector where we're working with our partner Formbird, um, looking at building, um, if you like, an order to invoice optimization, um, because we've had a lot of issues when we have existing systems, which are difficult to integrate with. So in, in this particular case, we're, we're, we're pulling everything into one database and it makes it a lot easier to do the optimization and uh, to keep track of what's going on and so on. So that's an interesting development. I mean, we're all, we are already working with other partners like CMS and or Coda, where they've embedded their our tech their our technology deeply inside their own systems. But uh, for a lot of customers, they have, you know, sometimes not very much at all, uh, or they're work, working with Excel, and this is a, an easier way to actually deliver the end result for for our customers. We've also been doing some um, more strategic optimization, and this is things like you know particularly with covid how can i minimize the number of drivers i use because we often see a situation where everyone's really busy but when you actually analyze it some drivers are, are doing say six or seven hours other drivers are doing 11 hours but if you can get all the drivers uh, consistently to do the sort of target 10 hours or 10 and a half hours that they like to do and you can reduce the number of vehicles and we, we've seen reductions of sort of 10 and sometimes 20 percent in the number of vehicles which sounds a lot but when you actually look at the hours worked i think part of that is because when people are uh, are doing only if uh, you know less than eight hours a day they often get paid for eight hours so they're not necessarily going to complain so it's really just uh, making sure that everyone gets a fair share of uh, of the work another interesting project we're going into commissioning is the uh, optimal train passing with uh, Rio Tinto and Itachi. That's obviously a rail application. And this is quite an interesting one because it all fits into Rio Tinto's idea to um, reach net zero and reduce fuel consumption and also uh, in increase the throughput of the network. So that's quite an in interesting project for, um, for the rail sector. And in the manufacturing sector, um, we've been doing some work in uh, production scheduling and disruption management. This is, an, again, an interesting one where some this particular manufacturer was concerned that they couldn't get all the parts or all the labor they needed. So a typical production scheduling software says, OK, what do you want to make by when? And then works backwards and said, oh, well, you need these parts, these people, these machines. But that wasn't their problem. It's more of we've got these people, these parts and these machines. Now, what can we do? So we, we basically um, modified our platform to do this problem. And it's almost um, not too strong a point to say at the touch of a button, 
we can reconfigure the workforce to actually still be working effectively on doing something <clears throat> rather than stopping uh, and worrying about where the next parts come from because we can calculate uh, how many people we can keep busy with the materials that are available and uh, we'll be talking today about alert safe so as uh, mark mark and david will be talking about the incorporation of new models so i won't uh, steal their thunder there um we've carried on our work with ambulance victoria helping them redesign their rosters to avoid fatigue and um improve uh, improve the um the well-being of their staff and david's been working with a company called western power again looking at um uh, improving rosters for people who are working 24 7 in the utilities sector and uh, finally we've been doing some work around net zero <clears throat> so there's two projects uh, that's happening at the moment the first one is uh, it's a technology called auto plant layout this is when you want to build some of these new plants which make hydrogen or um, ammonia uh, from things like uh, you know, electrolysis of water or um, carbon capture and storage, one of the big uh, big um, costs is really just the pipes between the pieces of equipment because it's often very expensive. So this is a, a way of automatically optimizing the layout to reduce the cost of the, the process plant, but also reduce the time taken uh, compared to the manual method. And the other one is our project with uh, the RACE for 2030, which is reliable uh, and clean energy. This is a, a project looking at how to make better decisions as you get to net zero. We've done a, a scoping study and now we're starting a new project to actually start building the software. Um, so what are we gonna be doing next year? Well, hopefully we've applied for a, a government grant with Monash to develop the auto plant layout software which I'm assured it, there's a decision in late 2022, hopefully not New Year's Eve. Um, we're quite optimistic that the POC will lead to some more work in manufacturing. Um, now we've got a lot of transport uh, prospects in the pipeline and there's another net zero project, which is around uh, modeling the production of hydrogen uh, on a global scale for one of the big uh, hydrocarbon companies. So finally, uh, what are we seeing in, in um, industry at the moment? Well, like I said, staff shortages is one of big deal. We've, the, the government's talking a lot about productivity <clears throat> and obviously compliance and environment. But one of my um, long held beliefs in productivity is we spend a lot of time worrying about people like truck drivers and factory staff and where the big productivity improvements could potentially be is in the admin <clears throat> and the back office staff because if you see the productivity increase in, in the past have all been about um, you know replacing a person with a machine or giving a guy a digger or making something in a, on a production line and this is all about using technology to improve if you like the manual tasks but I think the opportunity now is to use software to improve the productivity not just the sort of basic admin that's been done in the past with you know like the likes of uh, SAP but you know, decision support systems to make decisions easier and quicker and almost automatic in a lot of companies. So if there's any questions, I'm quite happy to take them. Otherwise, I'll um, give way to Mark to talk about the uh, the new model in AlertSafe. OK, Mark, you want to go? So hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah. Great. So um, I'm Professor Mark Wallace. I'm a professor at uh, Monash um, in the IT faculty. And we've been working together with Psych um, in some big projects. There's a, a major um, cooperative research center um, which we've been involved in. Um, that's been over the seven years. It's come to an end now, um, involving a number of universities. So Monash, Sydney, and Flinders and quite a bunch of industry partners as well. Um, so we've had a kind of number of outcomes outlined on the right-hand side. Um, and really what we've been looking at is 
alertness. So the original proposal we made for, was uh, to examine uh, tiredness, but uh, alertness is, is a much more positive way to put things. Um, and we're modeling neurophysiological states and also supporting that with sleep laboratories looking at um, how people sleep um, in the lab. So looking at alertness and tiredness, um, what we've really been looking at in, in the uh, CRC is tiredness in the sense of need to sleep. So if you watch the World Cup every night, then uh, you sleep during the day and you don't work so well. There are other sources of tiredness, so physical exhaustion, of course, um, which again is something that um, can happen to people at work, um, can be a consequence of, of certain kinds of work, or boredom, again, another kind of work where you just repeat the same activity time and time again. And so the neurophysiological study was really more on tiredness in the sense of need to sleep. So Monash has been looking at sleep um, for some time. So sleep is the third pillar of good health. So we say alongside diet and exercise. But it also, in terms of what we're looking at, was what happens in terms of shift work. So investigating a person's ability to adapt to shift work um, and its consequences on sleep. So the neuroscience aspects of it is looking at the mechanisms, the, the neural mechanisms that control sleep and alertness, and also understanding how sleep deprivation um, reduces people's productivity at work and makes it harder to, to do the right work and, and encourages, uh, causes more errors uh, during work. Looking at the key factors affecting sleepiness, one is just uh, how long since you last slept. So that, that fatigue state registers in the brain time since the last sleep. Certain um, voltages increase in certain neurons and so on. Um, and that's affected, that in creative increase, by the intensity of the activity. Um, but it can be temporarily relieved by drugs such as coffee, um, which we all use to postpone sleepiness. Uh, in certain situations. The other major factor is the circadian rhythm. So this is the thing that gets uh, affected when you fly to another time zone. Um, our body kind of naturally needs regular sleep roughly every 24 hours, um, but that can be changed by light and it shifts slowly. So when you're forced to stay awake as you move towards move into a night shift, your circadian rhythm does shift slowly to adapt but really that shift isn't, isn't uh, instantaneous. It, you suffer for several nights. Um, some estimates are about a shift of, a, of kind of an hour a day, um, but that can be speeded up and it's different in different people. What is clear is that um, a lot of um, really bad things happen because people have not adapted their circadian state to the early morning. So if they're working the Three Mile Island um, nuclear disaster, the purple chemical disaster, um, Chernobyl, the Exxon Valdez, and of course the Estonia Ferry, which we've um, got a bit of vision of here, all happened uh, in the early morning when people were not at their best and sharpest in terms of controlling um, important infrastructure. The Monash model essentially combines two earlier models um, of alertness and tiredness. The first one was looking at um, sleep wake dynamics um, based on the physiology of the brainstem ascending arousal system. So, this is the increasing need to sleep um, as time grows since the last sleep. And the other study was really on intercircadian adaptation in the brain. And so, this is looking at, um, well, the non photonic component of a light based mathematical model of the human circadian pacemaker. Lots of words, but essentially, looking at these two factors and integrating those into one model. And so to get these two models, the model of increasing fatigue and the model of circadian adaption to, to coordinate, to, to integrate, um, we had to introduce variables and parameters to achieve the consistency of this model across all the model equations um, of the brain states. What happens when you have a neural model is that you model the brain in a certain state and say, well, in this state, it's going to move into a a new state um, as a result of the firing of, of uh, neurons and synapses. Um, so what you want to do to model it is to see the success 
succession of states, each one a consequence of the previous state. So you're assen essentially simulating the brain. But each step might have a slight diversion from what actually happens, and so you'll get an increased diversion further into the future. So like with weather forecasting, you, know, you can predict quite well what's happening in the near future, but as you go further into the future, you're going to diverge more from the actual reality. But we have to essentially embed such a simulation when we're doing shift rostering so on into our rostering algorithms. For the raw neurophysiological model, then any time you spend awake, and that doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're working or you're just um, sitting around reading the newspaper, essentially has the same impact on sleepiness. But because some work requires more concentration and, and carries greater risk, so air traffic control or captaining a ship, um, we want to reflect that uh, essence of uh, the intensity of work and the risk associated work with work in parameter settings in the model. So we can adapt the model um, based on historical statistics um, to adapt that model for different kinds of work. So all this modeling enables us to look at rosters and, and people working in shifts to understand the impact of rosters on their ability to be productive and effective and not make errors. And so we can easily analyze rosters, and this is just a, a part of a much longer roster of, of months or so. When you can look at under this roster, what are the risky shifts for which um, workers are they risky? And we can look at the maximum, if you like, sleepiness or um, an intense period of sleepiness over a certain period of time, different ways of looking at that um, uh, risky roster. But in particular, what Dave's going to talk about is handling um, on-call shifts where it's not quite clear what somebody is actually going to do during that on-call period. So here's a second use case where we actually have to cover a certain amount of duty. Maybe it's in a hospital, a number of nurses of different grades on uh, different wards for different periods of time. And we want to cover that uh, the requirement with a workforce minimizing the amount of um, tiredness involved. So minimizing the risk, minimizing the number of errors that occur, minimizing the number of people who don't turn up because they're too tired and they get ill. Um, and that integration of um, a neurophysiological model into a rostering system is something uh, novel that uh, Opturin has achieved. The other aspect of this is to be able to reassign workers safely on the day. So, for example, in, in the, the Melbourne um, Fire Brigade, a lot of people don't turn up on the morning and you have to actually schedule with the workforce that is there and reschedule, again, ensuring coverage, but minimizing the, the risk due to people being over fatigued. And the third use case I want to briefly mention is um, looking at people who have a, a certain sequence of shifts on their roster and suggesting to them when they should sleep in order to be maximally awake during their period of work. Um, again, this uh, sleep suggestion, this proposal comes out of the, the model um, and tells when they can best recover. Um, and that can be shared with people. So this is on a mobile phone. So those are the use cases I wanted to cover briefly. Um, I'm going to hand over now to David to uh, talk about um, the actual applications that Optione has implemented. Thanks, Mark. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll just share my screen as well. Stay with me. Oh, sorry. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is what, we, what we're calling stochastic roster analysis. So I'm going to lead in with explaining, first of all, what is roster analysis before we complicate it with adding stochastic to that. Yeah. So what we talk about when I mean roster analysis, uh, basically we've got two types of analyses. So we can look at, you know, planned work. So this is, you know, in the future, but it's it's we've, it's known and it's planned, it's an existing roster. We can look at um, an actual worked roster. That can be both in terms of time sheets or time and attendance data or just the shift the person was working. So these are existing rosters. Uh, we've also used it in what if or future rosters. So this is when a company is looking or a client is looking to possibly implement new rosters. 
um, they have a variety of different possibilities and they want to you know learn more about what makes them different what are some positives uh, to some rosters what are some negatives to others so as part of this we can check uh, a roster against business rules and, and as well as some of the uh, fatigue risk models that we've implemented so the main reason why we want to do this is really just to ensure compliance or determine the adequate response to risk so you know it's not always possible to completely eliminate uh, these factors from a roster but you know, knowledge is power and knowing that particular days or shifts or staff uh, have, you know, issues around their roster means that you can implement, you know, um, fatigue management plans and, and extra assistance for them on the day. So as part of kind of the, the roster analysis platform, we, on top of the, the models, we apply these rules or what we call the alertness checks. Uh, so on the screen now is just basically a list of all the ones that we can support currently. So these are often around things like maximum consecutive shifts. Um, we can also split those off, well, that's of any type. We can also split them into consecutive night shifts or consecutive early shifts. So for instance, you might not want to work more than four night shifts in a row. You can put that in as a parameter and check the roster for anything that occurs where that would be violated. You can check for quick returns. So you can set a time Do you want between shifts, uh, backward rotation. So a good rostering principle is that you either start the following day or you know at the same time or after the time that you started on the previous day uh, so you avoid you know rotating backwards through time uh, we've also got checks on maximum shift duration uh, this is often usually more around if you're using time and attendance data you might say you don't want people to work on 16 hour stretch you see if that occurred uh, maximum amount of work in 24 hours any uh, we've got maximum work duration in any number of days minimum days off when you rotate from night to day, uh, as well as a separate check on the actual number of hours. So that depends on, we found cl different clients use different ways to, to really kind of represent that, that check. And also the minimum consecutive days off. So that's once someone starts a break, you want to have them at, you know, at least a certain number of days before they return to work. So what we've also got is some of these, is for the fatigue models. So uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is the fatigue index. So what this is, is a value between zero and 100 uh, which gives it's the probability of a worker having a high level of sleepiness. Uh, so what do we mean by a high level of sleepiness? It's specifically, it's the percentage likelihood, hence between zero and 100, of achieving a score of eight or nine on the Karolinska sleepiness scale, the KSS, which is shown here. So eight or nine is anywhere from sleepy with some difficulty remaining awake or extremely sleepy and you're actively fighting sleep. So for instance here, a, a fatigue index of 50, would mean that there's a you know toss of a coin 50 percent chance that this person is you know really having a, a tough time staying awake uh, we've also got the the risk index so this is slightly different uh from the fatigue index um so it represents the average relative risk of the occurrence of an incident on a particular shift so the way that this index was created was they took what was in the literature call they referred to as a typical two day two night and then a four off schedule uh, shift changes were at 0719, kind of used an average commute of 40 minutes, some moderately demanding and continuous attention with work, as well as a break scheme there. And so what they ran this over 21 consecutive cycles, that's 24 weeks, and they said that that is a risk index of one. Uh, so therefore it's normalized against that. So if uh, here they've got the example that if the shift pattern has a risk index of two, it's a doubling of the risk. And as Mark's uh, just discussed before uh, we've also recently been working on implementing this new model out of Monash uh, this is an example here in this um, this image of the output from the graph or oh, sorry from the, um, the analysis that actually you can either embed this in a in a PDF directly or uh, actually have it in like return to you as part of a spreadsheet and you can see across the bottom it predicts various states so we've got uh, the bottom in this uh this my mouse there we go sleeping to awake preparation for work commute to work and then actually working and the model predicts based on the the times of work and input parameters which are commute and preparation time uh, what state you'll be in and then on top we've got the fatigue score predicted by the actual model so uh, i'm just going to briefly discuss a case study that we did here so uh, there's a client that provided non-emergency sorry miss uh, there's a misspelling mistake there non-emergency non-emergency patient transport in rural areas uh, so often staff were on call for extended period of times and they can actually sleep in the vehicle when not working so you know they'd kind of have an on, a block of on call time they do jobs that might be you know quite short or you know reasonably long and then in between if they could they'd nap so 
because this was quite a complicated uh, system, we actually utilized the Monash model to predict the sleep likelihood. So this is a, an actual kind of screen grab from the, the report that we prepared for them. So we can see on day 47, uh, particularly in days 54 and 55, there's quite a lot of spikes of uh, short periods of working. So what we had is, particularly if we dive in here on kind of this period, we had seven call outs from across kind of day 47 to the, the morning of day 48. Uh, if we look at the state, we can see on, down on the bottom here in the blue line that during kind of most of the day, once the person woke up and they did these, you know, these spikes of work, um, there wasn't a period where they returned to sleep until it got quite late in the day. So it was late in day 47 where they actually were tired enough uh, that when they finished a job, they could actually go to sleep in the cab and they were asleep for a period of time. Unfortunately, they didn't get long before they were called out again. But the model also predicts that, you know, over that, they had a bit of sleep there over midnight, then returned to work again. Um, then based on the idea that they, they did receive just enough sleep uh, in that period that they wouldn't be tired enough to return to sleep until, you know, late in the evening on the following day when they actually didn't have any work. Uh, I think they were off in this case. Um, if we actually look up on the fatigue score as well, you can see the implication of that lack, or the, the fact that they've only really had a couple of hours of sleep in that, you know, the peaks remain roughly the same, but I think the focal point is the fact that the trough on day 48 uh, does not drop back down again quite low and you really maintain a high level of fatigue, kind of that area under the curve. So it's that idea of the buildup of kind of accumulation of fatigue throughout the day rather than necessarily every single, you know, just maximum score at a certain time. So the graphical representation was particularly useful for the client as it represents the frequency of call at. So it was all good having these written down in a table of, you know, the times that people were, were on call and, and the jobs that they would that they did. But to have it displayed on a timeline uh, was very useful for the client. It also was interesting to see, you know, based on the prediction of the model, when staff would sleep. And obviously time, you know, it wasn't just a fact of the time between jobs because we didn't, they didn't know going into it, you know, how long they'd have between times. It was, you know, just went from job to job. Other times they had, you know, quite extended periods of time. So the frequency of call outs in a, in a night shift uh, was shown to have the largest impact on the sleep availability. So that was obviously due to the fact that during the day they weren't tired enough to nap. And as Mark spoke about earlier with the circadian rhythm, you know, midday, sun, it's very bright. Uh, you're just not going to feel like sleeping. So it did open discussion around various things that could be done, such as uh, providing better like light blocking materials in the cab so that people even in the late, you know, if it's kind of the afternoon with the light dimming, they had time to put those up maybe it would assist with you know getting some sleep in the afternoon so oh yeah, sorry so this kind of leads into we've talked about existing rosters or time and attendance data where we've got a set of planned known times uh what then leads on from that is this idea of uncertainty in, in rostering being on call shifts so what do we when we talk about on call shifts it's always really been kind of the Achilles heel of roster analysis. Um, no one's really come up with a good way to look at it. So, uh, you know, when we start looking at patterns, it really becomes infeasible to, to kind of enumerate every single combination, even for very small rosters. So if you look at this kind of the table I've put here, we just have even just three shift types. So a day, an evening, and a night. You could obviously be off as well. So we've got four kind of possibles or possible choices for a day. If you look at ignoring what I've said, illegal rotations, you obviously you're not going to go from a night shift to a day shift. Even when you get to, you know, five shifts in a row, there's a thousand and twenty-four possible combinations of rosters that you'd have to, you know, analyze every single one of them to look across, you know, all the possible combination. And it's just not possible to do in reality. So what we've now finally got to is the kind of crux of the issue being what we've implemented here is stochastic roster analysis. So what do I mean by stochastic? Uh, it's a nice fancy word for probability. Um, it basically describes something that has a random variable. So in this case, stochastic roster analysis is talking about analyzing rosters with, you know, with randomness and it utilizes mathematical, mathematical methods to account for uncertainty. So uh, what we do is we allow for the simulation of rosters and determine the probability of occurrences. So what are the inputs to this, uh, to this, uh, this analysis? So 
at the minimum, we need you know your staff, uh, your shifts, the roles that the staff are working, and then the actual rosters that you're going to analyze. So on-call shifts are modeled using uh, the likelihood that a worker is required. And we can also account for a previous shift. So for instance, um, if you've got multiple on-call shifts in a row, you can set this up so that you know the person is not going to, if they've done a night shift, say, the day before, they can't do a day shift the next day. You know, so that's, that's not allowed. So as part of that, what do we actually produce from this analysis? So we produce the staff rosters where, for instance, the percentage likelihood for each shift type is work. So if you have on a day a set of possible shifts uh, based on the percentage likelihoods will return roughly you know, the estimate of what they will, how, how often they'll occur. Uh, so for each alertness check or in the, or the fatigue model, we get the percentage of shifts in exceedance of that bound or the various checks that you can put in place. Uh, we also provide some day summaries. So this is really useful for identifying hotspots. And we also provide staff summaries, which include average hours worked, you know, average on-call hours, and the averages for alertness checks in the fatigue model. So on the screen here is just a sample of that output. So it's just a, well, it's an eight-day roster for a staff member. Uh, the first, or rather days two, three, and four, if we look in the shift uh, row, the very top row there, or the second row rather, um, the, they work today, day, and then a night. The, um, forward slash in the R is the role that they were working. So we can ignore that really. There's only one role in this uh, case. Uh, because these were actually planned shifts, they're, they're never absent. Uh, and if we look down the columns, you can see kind of the maximum fatigue index, FI stands for percent FI violation. So you can set a maximum limit that you want to see for fatigue scores. And this is the percentage of shifts that went above it. In this case, there were none, uh, as well as some other checks. I, I won't go through everything, it'd be a bit tedious. But the main thing is on day six, seven, and eight, where we have these on-call shifts, now, if we look on day one, there's a for day shift of, of the on-call shifts, 20% of those became day shifts and 30% were night. And that actually tied into the fact that, that was, there was this, the split provided by the client. Um, if we go to day seven, we see that it's slightly different. And that's because the fact that, that if you are doing a night shift on day six, it will limit your options on the following day. You're not going to be able to necessarily, if, even if it's required, do that day shift. And we can see as we kind of look through here, uh, various percentage. The interesting one, particularly for the client here, was the rolling violation. So the client had a max; they wanted to check that they know no, they never worked more than fifty hours in seven days. And what this number here says is that, well, unfortunately, forty-three percent of the time, you know, based on these these probabilities, uh, this shift's going to be involved in a block of in somewhere in seven days where you're exceeding uh, fifty hours. So, and then once we get to day eight, that jumps to seventy-one percent. So obviously, what are the benefits of this? Uh, the big ones around the automation, uh, as I said previously, generating, you know, which we've actually done before for small rosters, enumerating all possible combinations, computing the probabilities and crunching all the numbers is time consuming and it's tedious and it's very prone to error. Uh, this is an automated process. You create the data file, you upload it. It's depending on how long, how many simulations you want to run. It's very fast. Uh, even I've run this for tens of thousands of iterations in the time it takes you to go and pour a glass of water and come back, it's, you know, it's finished running. So the results are present, were presented as probabilities, um, which is really the only way you can talk about, you know, on-call shifts. Uh, in When we're looking at planned rosters, we can actually talk about certainty and say, you know, this is the fatigue score on this day, or this is the implication of, you know, too many night shifts in a row. Uh, when you talk about Things with probability obviously we can only talk then the results have to be in the same kind of terminology in terms of percentage of shifts that would exceed that value so just to finish off uh, i've got another case study here uh, and this is where we actually utilized this type of analysis for a client so they had implemented a roster with a high number of on-call shifts but it really was around covering covid 19 related absenteeism so this was a 24 7 operation it was very important that you know they had staff a certain minimum number of staff present and so if someone was called in sick another person got the call and so they had very high uh, on-call kind of procedure around the roster so this obviously led to a great concern about what the impact of varying likelihoods of on-call requirement would have on the fatigue and risk uh, as well as the business rules that they had so uh, so due to the stochastic or probabilistic nature of this problem, the client was really unable to, to do this themselves. 
So the roster involved repeating patterns of both on-call and planned shifts. Uh, so in this table here, we can see there's the two different patterns. There was either three on-call shifts, a day off, and then a day, day, night, night plan, or a two on-call off day, day, night, night pattern. So well, the other rules, you can't have a day shift occur directly after a night shift. So that actually, even just with a short roster like this, that's just eight days, there was 27 possible patterns that could be derived from you know the three on off and then four on. So based on information from the client, they said that if an on-call on shift is required, uh, there was a 40% likelihood it would be a day shift and then a 60% likelihood it would be a night shift. Uh, but there was some uncertainty around overall likelihood uh, a worker would be required. And so what we ended up doing was modeling kind of across the whole spectrum of probabilities. So we looked at everything from a 0%. So workers are never required. Obviously, this is like your best case scenario. We also looked at 100% being the worst case scenario where they're required every single time. And then between that, 25, 50, and 75%. So we kind of did a stepped progression through the various percentages. And um, the way we actually represent that in the input is what's shown here in this table. Uh, this is the value for 50%. If we look at the, the sum of these probabilities is, is 50. Uh, you define a kind of group of shifts. In this case, I've originally called it on call. And that can either be a day shift, which occurs with likelihood of 20%, or a night shift with 30%. And the day shift has that forbidden previous shift of night. So that's how we represent it. So it's kind of as simple as just building this table up. So because this roster, uh, well, we actually replicated as well, not just the eight days, but the full rotation through two cycles of the roster. And we simulated over 10,000 times. So for each of the, the 0, 25, 50, and all, all the kind of various probabilities, um, what we ended up is we put all that together for the client, and it really allowed the client to understand the effect of the varying on-call likelihoods and assist in the development of further fatigue risk mitigation strategies. So before, you know, they, they really had no idea about where the tipping point was from them as a business to consider where the new percentage of on-call started to create issues for them. And this showed them that, you know, in reality, that percentage can actually get a lot higher than what they, they thought it, it currently was uh, and gave them the confidence to know that, you know, what they were doing was, was all right and that they still needed to, you know, check and manage and balance the staff. Uh, so this is actually just a sample of the output we provided to them across, you know, so this is, uh, over two rotations, it was 13 days. Uh, and this is the number of hours were predicted that you'd work uh, based on the various call out. So the base roster of planned work involved 87 hours of planned work. Uh, at 100% on call, they'd be doing 119 hours and you know almost a straight line through it. Uh, the fatigue checks were a slightly different uh, issue in terms of the uh, there was a slight growth across you know, all of them. The number of occurrences of working more than 50 hours in seven days, though, really uh, skyrocketed quite quickly once we once we kind of left the above 50% mark. Uh, and that was probably the most concerning to them that they, they wanted to really kind of rein that in a bit and it made them think that they wanted to limit that, you know, to 50% to 50 kind of on call at the absolute maximum where possible. Uh, so that's actually, the end of my uh, component. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll just uh, slideshow. Fantastic. Hopefully that means I explained everything so thoroughly. I think you're muted, Alan. I was, going to, I was going to ask you about the um, where you think this might go in terms of um, comparing the poor sleep with fatigue, whether we could ever get some sort of correlation between the models that we've got. And, yeah, and, so, I mean, that's obviously the, um, the idea that, that sleep is the lack of sleep is a thing that gets you the worst. Yeah. So obviously now we've we've got a couple of models that we've, we've now implemented and the logical kind of next step to that is to start looking at you know a bit of a synthesis between you know various checks and and using some some kind of machine learning and and AI to predict you know based on one what can we what can we learn about the other um, some other further reaches I can see for this is particularly around utilizing the Monash model and its ability to predict sleep and, and 
you know, handle that kind of repeated flurry of little bits of activity is around extending the way that we handle kind of this on-call or stochastic processes to not just model on-call entire shifts, but to handle the idea of more what, what I showed in the, the first case study there, which is this on-call, you know, where you're not necessarily, you're on call for certain uh, the, the, the time period, but then there's kind of spikes of actual work to do during it rather than just you've been called in for an entire shift. So that difference between, say, uh, which Tom would probably be familiar with, uh, on-call work at a hospital, you get the call, particularly if you're on nurse pool or bank, you know, we need you to come and cover a day shift on this ward. You get there at 7.30, you finish at 3.30, you work the entire shift, uh, as opposed to on-call work for non-emergency patient transport where they might do a half hour job and then some period of time they have off and then they do another could be a couple of immediate jobs a big break a big job and then they finish later so that would probably be the uh one of the next stages i think that we would we would take this down to be able to handle that kind of you know it's still on call work but it's a, it's a different flavor well i was going to be cheeky and ask tom what happens what happens at the hospital when a consultant gets called in to do a judgment and then presumably goes home again uh, I'm, I'm not sure with the doctors, but um, if, if a scientist had to go in, then we would get a break. Um, if we get called on the telephone, which is what you, what what actually happens, and we don't have to go in for some of the senior staff to answer problems, then it's not, we'd go into work as usual the next morning if we get called during the night. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well... If, it's, if uh, is there any other questions or comments about this or any of the other things we talked about? Only comment I have. I'm Scott from Hills Tankers. Um, we run a transport company where we run 24/7, so yeah. we have over 250 drivers that run around the clock, and this is a huge part of our industry, um, yeah. and it's a huge problem for us in our industry. Um, most of our shifts start between midnight and 2 a.m., and the same in the afternoon. Yeah, and um, we're actually doing some work on seeing line machines. We're just getting two installed into two of our vehicles next week that monitor the driver's eyes, and yeah. they take it off the road, and, and it, it actually shakes the seat. And um, so it's very interesting. But um, we'd be keen to to know some more about this as it goes along because it, it's when you start installing some of these seeing line machines and things like that, it's marvelous how many close calls you have where you don't actually know about them. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well. I think something from just like spitballing an idea, if you would, stuff, if, if you can collect data around, you know, number of instances, and, and obviously these are probably all time stamps. Uh, we've spoken before to customers around this idea of using that information in conjunction with the fatigue models to, you know, kind of tailor make fatigue models that match, you know, kind of the, the data that you've got and, mm. you know, knowledge about when these you know, incidences actually occur so that's something that's very interesting yeah there was a big study done in the alertness crc with the heavy vehicle regulator you, you were aware of that weren't you mark yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the re results came out the results that came out were a bit mixed but i think that was a lot a lot was that was due to self-reporting rather than you know hmm. I, i'm familiar with the seeing machines it's the thing that looks at your uh droopy eye droopy eyes yeah. isn't it if yeah. you look out the window for too long, it'll it'll alert you. It'll... Yeah, <laughs> well, that's not that's probably not good either, is it? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think mining companies have used the seeing machines quite a lot. Mm. Um, it's, it's interesting the data on them. So our shifts, we actually have three to a truck. So one's on day shift, one's on night shift, one's off. And it's interesting. We, as long as them three guys are happy, and we we actually wrote so all our shifts are staggered because you can't start all the trucks to go to the one low point at once. And a lot of our guys, a lot of our shift times are around traffic, especially Brisbane, where we're on base. So they'll move their shift times forward so they can be out of Brisbane before the traffic starts. But it's not necessarily the best for their fatigue. So it's, yeah. it's yeah. a hard one. So if you start them at the ideal fatigue time, you fire them straight into traffic. So at the end of their shift, you get more fatigue. So it's a it's a really merry dance. And, mm. and it's, it's not it's optimization really problem. Problem. <laughs> Probably, yeah. That's no, interesting. Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of the rules on transport are fairly fairly straightforward, aren't they? They're not really t tailored to individual circumstances. But it'd be interesting to try and get a measure, you know, given those two alternative starting times as to what the consequences were in terms of the fatigue state at the end, you mm. know, for the drivers. Well, that's um, that's, that's something we have uh, we've looked at for customers where we've 
uh, they, they've had a 12 hour, you know, or, or 10 hour shift, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to look at, you know, 10 hours from, you know, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. And then what is the actual profile across all those, you know, to identify potential, because this was, a, we were looking at, uh, this is this what if planning I was talking about, where we were looking to build new rosters. And they had, you know, potentially different types of shifts. And they found that, you know, for them, based on their data, they really didn't want to start, you know, before a certain time. And they didn't want this to start too late because it meant that the the she kind of uh, you know the shift that was covering the other to other part of the day would then finish too late. So it was this kind of balancing act of making sure people don't start too late, but also you know the other shift doesn't finish too early. And so moving them around and trying to find that point that was the best for everyone. Yeah, it's quite, that's quite an interesting bit. question anyway. And if you get some data, we'd be quite happy to look at it. The hard part about can... shift work is one shift's going to be shitty, right? You're either going to have a really long night shift through to five in the morning or you're going to have a really yeah. early day shift so your night shifts are easier and it's interesting yeah. in machines it doesn't matter if it's day shift or afternoon shift so our afternoon started about 1 p.m the most yeah. set offs of the cn machines on the where it shakes the seat is in the first two hours of either shift that's mm. when we get the most fatigue events yeah it doesn't matter if it's a.m or p.m it's, it, i find that yeah. very interesting i would never have i would never have won that bet <laughs> yeah i wonder if it has to do uh with the time the people uh, get up because mm. it sounds like if it's you know if you're like i know my, my partner's a nurse and my wife now, i should say um yes you know she, she <laughs> is I keep forgetting that <laughs> um if she's on an afternoon shift she's not gonna up at five o'clock in the morning you know she's she's yep. gonna sleep in she's gonna get up later so i wonder if all you're doing in that case is shifting the same period of you know in, in your your 16 hours of being awake if you're, you're four hours in is when you're most tired you just move that later on if you're working an afternoon shift yep. so, yeah yeah that's huge effects on body hmm. yeah my wife's the nurse we spent seven years and eight hours at ivf oh. she give up shift work and yeah. fell pregnant in three months <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's it has all a kinds of. Uh, to, she just went to straight day shifts, and wow. so it's it's huge. Yeah. Oh, the the shift work has a has a tremendous, and it's not just. I mean, on your your kind of like fatigue, but also just um, the fact that you know then your time off is spent mm. kind of just sleeping to recover for, her and you don't get the the other side of recovery, which is the the kind of mental, you know, see friends, have a life, you know, partake in kind of common activities and. Mm. you lose some of that as well and that's you know yeah, yeah. not necessarily captured it by a fatigue model but it is an implication of it that's you know still to be considered alan we'll be talking i can uh, we're putting the two new ones in the start next week so in the new year if you're chasing some data around that yeah it'd be useful. All. like i said the national vehicle regulator didn't really wasn't really conclusive but certainly that's more objective data um mm. no, it's very interesting yeah. Sean and myself right. are keen to work with some of that stuff. Yeah. Okay, right. so I think we finished almost uh, slightly ahead of time. Unless there's any any other. So Tara, what do we got planned for the new year? Have we got a date yet? Are we gonna? Is it a TBA? Uh, yes, it's the first week of March, um, and I think the seventh to be exact. Okay. Cool. Well, well, um, just to wish everyone on the call season's greetings happy holidays or whatever um and hope to have a good break and we'll see you in the new year thanks guys thanks thanks everyone thank you